Thanks very much. Can you uh, hear me at the back? Could you just tell me without? Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. And many thanks to the organisers for inviting me because I've been uh, for many years uh, working to develop action research around the world, but in particular <coughs> to encourage people to create what we call their own living educational theories. So what I've been doing is to say, for example, to everybody in this room, you've got the capacity to create your own living theory of your own practice and to explain your influence in whatever professional context that you're working. And not only that, but the knowledge that you have in this room can be made public in a way that can be accredited for masters and doctoral degrees. Now, that is what I've made, if you like, uh, an international reputation for. And when Jerome kindly said that I was a world leader in this field, it's not so much that I've created a theory that was imposed on everybody. I think what the reputation is based on is that I've been able to work with people like yourselves and gradually show how you can bring your knowledge that you exist and express in your everyday lives into a public form of communication that can be spread and influence others around the world and be accredited for masters and doctoral degrees. That is what I've actually specialised in. And before I start, just to bring you some of the resources which are freely available, and before I just explain that uh, this, if you like, isn't just a, a screen where you put slides up, um, or you offer a PowerPoint. What this is, is like an, an electronic portal that is actually bringing into this space resources and narratives from all over the world that other action researchers have made freely available to you, that you can actually use, download, share with others. And I'll be wanting to encourage you, and I want to check out if anybody here, and I know Mary has, Mary Hooker, I know uh, <coughs> Maggie has, I know Ivan has, they've actually brought their resources and it's gone the other way. So from this room, uh, I know some people already have sent their stories the other way, through the portal and into the world. <coughs> but before I start, could I just ask, and I, I do like to do this because often when I talk, there are people in my audience that already know a lot about the area that I'm talking about, and I'd like to check if anybody's can with any kind of questions that they feel in the course of the hour that they would like me to answer. So it's just to give you just that uh, few moments of space that if you have come with questions that you feel that you would like to ask, rather than wait to the end, we might not have time to develop them. It's just to give you a chance if you have come with any questions or interesting ideas that you want exploring, if you could just say it so now and it'll give me a chance to answer. So I'll just pause and just ask, has anybody come with uh, questions about this field of action research or living theory that you feel you would like addressed during this hour. Maggie? Yeah. I'll make use of the opportunity <laughs> since the expert is in the room. Um, I'm wondering what your opinion would be, or let's rather say feedback or comments, in terms of the quantitative, you know, activists who would not want to necessarily buy in to a theory like um, action research. They're always very critical about it. Yeah, and that for me is absolutely okay. I, I started my life uh, from university as a physical scientist, so my first degree was a joint honours in physics and chemistry. And when I went into education, I then studied philosophy and psychology. <coughs> now, it took me six years as a full-time teacher before I could question the knowledge base coming from my physical science or my philosophers or my psychologists. And I've always encouraged people who are doing actual <coughs> research to use quantitative methods where appropriate because sometimes you do want to measure something. But I'll just give you um, why I think the action research is so unique and it, it's distinguished from the quantitative research that I have done and also research from many of the disciplines of education such as the philosophy or the psychology or the sociology which I always use, I draw insights from. But the action research is distinguished by a particular kind of questions where you as practitioners, I think, will always be asking yourselves questions of the kind, how do I do this better? And that is what distinguishes the action research. 
So it isn't that I um, have anything against or being critical of quantitative researchers, <coughs> apart from those quantitative researchers try to stop the actual research process. Do, you know, the, there's sometimes research committees in universities that all they had on, on their membership were quantitative researchers. And I've still got examples of where a research committee in the UK was asking, and this was recently, this was in the last two years, asked for the I in the question to be removed. Mm. Now, that, they were made to look so silly, so foolish, of trying to remove the I from an actual research question, because they couldn't cope with the methodology. So I'm nothing against the quantitative researcher doing the quantitative research, which is appropriate for them, and measuring, and the data that he's gathered to measure. But where I am critical is where they start to make judgments about a paradigm for which they're not competent to do it. Is there any other question that you feel you would just like me to address? Because I'll bring up on the screen uh, a really exciting project from South Africa, which is called the Transformative Educational Studies Project. It was funded by the National Foundation um, of South Africa, the Research Foundation. And you'll see the actual research question, how do I transform my practice, is right at the heart of this whole project. And it's trying to make sure that everybody's aware that if you do actual research, then you're willing to study your own practice with that kind of I question. And it doesn't deny the we questions, but it does mean that you are all knowledge creators. It does mean that you see yourselves as in your bodies and what you do, uh, just as I'm in the here and now, and I brought all my embodied knowledge to you. And I've actually, over the last 30, 40 years, continued to make this public. And I've published and got the, you know, the doctoral degree, master's degrees, in a way that shows what this knowledge can do with others. But let me just ask, are there any more questions that you feel? Yes? Yeah, I would like just to find out uh, about uh, the, the use of action research. Can it, can it be used to shorten the time period that one may be required to address a course so that action research becomes part of the learning process, that one goes through and finishes the course and graduates? Yes. The, the the kind of courses which I, and I'll show you where you can access the action research programs, some for masters, and I'll show you how you can access over 35 doctoral degrees that I've supervised personally over the last uh, 15 years as part of the accreditation. So the actual practical problem that each one of you, I think, will be faced, each one of you will have a unique problem, a concern, an interest. Jonathan, for example, was talking about media in Kenya about the digital technology, from the audio to the television, and evaluating the influence of this in the learning of, say, the teachers and students. Now, that can be part of an action research, master's or doctorate. <coughs> um, it doesn't shorten the time. For example, everybody registered with myself at the University of Bath, um, they would take a minimum of uh, three years, and that many of them, as part-time students, the minimum they would take would be about five years for a doctorate. Master's degrees in Canada, one of my former PhD students, the superintendent of schools, managed to get a cohort of 13 of the practitioners through a master's degree there with Brock University over two years, using these kinds of action research processes. But everybody asking that kind of, how do I improve what I'm doing? And it isn't an abstract, it isn't an outside kind of question. It's you studying your own practice to have an influence in the context of your life and work. Okay? Any, any others that you feel you'd like me to before I, I show you the resources that you know, can flow into this room? Yes, John? I think it matches very well with the knowledge society in terms of now being able to pick this, the, the, the ideas learned and putting them into a master's or a PhD program. What is the universal acceptability of this in terms of accreditation? Um, your experience is global. Was, uh, to me, I also think it is very important, even for places where knowledge is growing, to be able to pick the action research and be able to see how it grows, because one action research can actually lead to another. And the knowledge here is building in terms of experience and, and, and practice. So the global acceptance and the accreditation values, how do you see that? Yeah, and again, that's a very important question, John, because uh, 30 years ago, when I was getting all this work underway, it was very difficult indeed to get accreditation. Yep. 
you know, if you'd seen me in 1980 and 1982, I would be submitting two, two PhDs and not having them accepted. In the early 90s, my PhD just went through uh, with a statement, this is a very creative contribution, you've got your doctorate. Now, over that period of time, between the 1980 and 1990, the middle of the 1990s, a big change had occurred in terms of the acceptability. That when it started to get underway in the 70s, you wouldn't be able to find an examiner that would be okay. Now, it's very different. That you can go to different countries of the world. I've just examined doctorates in Australia. These are living theory doctorates of people studying their own practice in Australia, um, Canada, and uh, South Africa, <coughs> and also in the UK. And those are four. And those are just recent. Um, I think the most exciting work at the moment is going on at Dublin City University where their new regulations allow for the submission of what is called e-media through visual narratives. <coughs> now this is really at the forefront um, of this kind of work and Yvonne has just submitted her doctorate, it will be examined over this next week or so, <coughs> which is actually submitted in terms of visual narratives with lots of video and lots of narrative around the video so that text is no longer the dominant form of communication. Now that, it's such an important question that because the universities are beginning to catch up. But it's only in October, this coming October, that the International Journal of Teacher and Teacher Education is asking for submissions which go what they've called beyond scholarly inquiry through text. So they're wanting visual narratives, no longer just text-based or print-based, as most doctorates are. So there's a very exciting transformation going on, but you might still find that within a university which has not moved yet because the people in control of the research committee or the ethics committee, they could be engineers, they could be physical scientists, <coughs> but haven't actually got a track record of supervision of this kind of work. So You've got to make sure, John, I think you, you move and contact people who've got a good track record of this kind of supervision or this, these kind of doctrines. Anything else that you feel you'd just like me to tackle before? As I say, I show you the resources which are flying into the room, but also I'd like very much to just hopefully stimulate your imaginations to say that you can actually bring your knowledge as a knowledge creator and literally send it the other way. Because here, when you think of what's going on in Tanzania, or South Africa, or Kenya, Ethiopia, the work we going on in Ghana, I was in Nigeria, uh, Lagos earlier in the year, Covenant University, and work is going on there. Uh, I was in Mozambique as well as Kenya. And again, there's a real interest in developing the action research processes for continuing professional development. But let me just check last time, and then I'll just show you the kind of resources that, if you're interested in this work, you can do. Yes, Mike. I'm sorry, but I have another one um, linked to... For me, this is critical, because um, action research is based on you and your practices. And I want to know, how do we cope with the phenomenon of phenomenological suspension, the role of the researcher and taking your biases out of the process. Okay, now, action research is always grounded, literally, in phenomenology, because you're trying to understand the experience that you're having of your professional life and practice. Now, there's a very good philosopher called Gadamer, um, and he wrote a superb text on truth and method. His point was, we can never avoid bias. That wherever we're speaking from, even now, as I'm coming from the UK, you'll find that I will have certain biases which are coming from my culture. I try to become aware of them. But Gadamer said, look, what you've got to do is try to reduce your biases. You'll never get rid of them, but we advocate the use of a man called Jürgen Habermas, who had a, a great influence on what's called critical theory. And Habermas said that you and I use four criteria to reach an understanding together. And I always bring these into the kind of research accounts that I supervise or help with. And what Gadamer said was that to reduce bias, you have a validation group of, for example, between you know, three to eight people, and you could form many validation groups here. When you've 
produced an interpretation of your research, you submit it to your validation group and ask them to strengthen it in four ways. You say, can you help me to improve its comprehensibility? In other words, will it communicate? How might it communicate better to an audience? The second one is one any physical scientist like myself would recognise and say, is there sufficient evidence that you're bringing in to justify the claims that you're making? And that will satisfy any positivist researcher. That claim that when you're saying that you're having an influence in whatever you're working, can you back up that claim with sufficient evidence? If you claim to be influencing, like John, I think we'll need to show the influence of the very exciting uh, use of the television in terms of educational programs with teachers and students, what kind of evidence might be produced to show the influence that those programs are having on the learning of the students? Okay, so that's the evidence. Now the third one is more difficult because all, everybody in the room, including myself, is coming with what Habermas called cultural and normative influences. We're all influenced by these. And I'll give you one of my, um, a real shock for me 15 years ago. I thought my Western view of democracy was, if you like, it was one of my normative influences. I take it for granted. And then I had some Muslim students who actually gave me a text from a Saudi Arabian university on educational theory from um, an Islamic perspective. And what surprised me there was the point that the Western view of democracy was very, very different to the Islamic view of democracy. And now, in my work, I bring that understanding in to show that I've got a much deeper awareness the norm of the normative backgrounds in, from which I'm actually influenced. <coughs> uh, is that okay? Yeah, then, that's perfect. Yeah, the fourth one is one I think everybody here will really like, especially those that have been influenced by Ubuntu, uh, in the yeah. sense of the I am because we are. Yeah. And Hamavas says, look, you've really got to show your authenticity over time and interaction, that you truly believe in what it is you're claiming to believe in. So if I come to you and say, look, I really do believe in academic freedom, you would have a right to ask for me for the evidence over my lifetime in the universities that you can see the evidence that I've really struggled against abuses over academic freedom over time. And he said, you could only show that over time in interaction. So really, you won't have to make much of a judgment about my authenticity in the here and now, but over time, looking at my resources gathered over the last 20 years, you'll be able to make a judgment. Now, everybody here can do this. You could actually ask your friends, your colleagues, your peers to help you validate your explanations of your influence as you try to improve your practice. So I think, again, that's a really crucial question to hold at the heart of the actual research, the one to reduce the bias using those methods. Anything else that you're feeling <coughs> okay? Uh, you'd like to clarify? Yes? Could you, if you could give me your name and then the country. My name is uh, Daniel McKinney from Kenya. Kenya. Yeah, thank you for this session. I don't know much about uh, action research. I've just uh, had to see bits and pieces of it in literature. I, however, have a number of questions. One is uh, must one do action research for purposes of certification only? As you are saying that uh, we are more or less focusing on the doctorate degree. Yeah. Is there a way one could do action research that is not <coughs> certified by an examining body? Because I find this basically a lot of people do report on things that they do on a regular basis, like for example those people who do columns that are based on their own experiences. In Kenya we have a doctor who has been writing about his experiences in the in the in the theatre for the last over thirty years. So there are stories, long stories that date several years back. Does that for example qualify as action research? Yeah. And uh, what are some of the examples just to enlighten me because I may be new in this area. Yes, but uh, what some, is the that about? Yeah. some of the best examples uh, of the, uh, the start of action research, all of which, in my experience, they are, are all best started informally, so not accredited. That the very first time you're asking, how do I improve what I'm doing? It, it's wise to really start and start to inquire in that way as part of your professional life. Yeah. Now, the man who did. He did this for 25 years without accreditation. And I was asked to go uh, to Durban 
um, South Africa, this was two years ago, to help launch his book called When the Chalk is Down, and it's called W.B. Singh. And I'll give you the reference for that book. It's a brilliant book, and it's 25 years of action research <coughs> on how to undo an injustice because his parents' house and his land was taken away from them in relation to the apartheid era. And W.B. Singh spent 25 years of inquiry, and he was blocked. He was, well, how do I now move ahead? Blocked again. He was all the time trying to get justice for his parents. Uh, and it's a, quite a sad book because both these parents died before he actually was successful, but he was successful. Now that is a beautiful book, and it wasn't accredited. <coughs> but I was saying to WB saying, look, it's that kind of thing that we need putting in for doctorates, because the knowledge that he showed in that uh, apartheid era, and how he actually struggled against those values which were oppressive, uh, is exactly what I think you can bring into an accredited piece of work. Uh, this one here, You'll see this in the <coughs> news section of my website, and I'll show you the Action Research website now with the resources. It contains 40 something, I think it's about 46 stories, none of which are accredited. It was only published this last week. And it's about people who are trying to think of what it, what it is they want to do with their lives. What is it that's worthwhile? And they've been willing to actually tell their stories in the sense that these are the futures that they're trying to create through their story and their restoring of their lives. Now, I think it's really important, is that question, to actually recognise you're already started on these kind of inquiries, because I'll guarantee everybody in the room, wherever you are, is actually passionate about improving something in your practice. I think that's the only reason you're here. And this idea of African leadership in ICT, I think the only reason that you'll be coming to these sessions is because of this kind of passion to make a difference where you are. So I think you've already got underway, not perhaps in a public way, but intuitively, you're already saying to yourself, okay, I've got a concern here, it's a passionate one. It differs from everybody else here, but I imagine what to do. I act and I evaluate and I modify. And that is the action reflection cycle. And you can do that without being accredited. <coughs> I'll just show you where you can access some of those resources. Uh, these are non-accredited. The website, some of you might even get into it now, it's just the actionresearch.net, so you just put the HTTP, you know, the colon slash slash www.actionresearch.net, and you can get into it now, and that gives you a tremendous number of resources. And next week, because I was only just uh, given this one on living legacies, stories creating futures, and when you think of your session, um, which we've just had earlier, about the sense of futures thinking, each of these individuals is recognising that they're actually, through what they're doing, creating a future which doesn't yet exist, but through their stories and through their work together, they're generating that future. And this idea that some of them, the living legacies, I was really uh, powerfully moved by this because well, one of the women um, was diagnosed with um, cancer and she recognised that what she wanted to do in the time that was left, because she <coughs> continued to be very articulate, the cancer did not affect her mind, and her reflections were very powerful. And she said, Jack, what I really want to do now is have a, le a living legacy for others to find useful in terms of the life I've led. And other people have liked that idea, and the whole book is actually created with those living legacies. But it's a very attractive, it was produced by an artist um, called Andy Helen, and it's not for you to read, but it's just a very attractive uh, text which will be accessible. I'll show you where you can access it from, um, from my website, and I'll just go back to the beginning of my website, which is, as I said, it's theactionresearch.net. This is enlarged a little, but it will be here next week. You'll be able to go into the, what's new in the 12, 13 academic year, and it will be here. It'll just be called Living Legacies, you'll be able to click on it, and it will download. Now this is where I'm now saying that this is an e-portal, that the, these resources, you access them now, you can download, you can use them however you like. And the one that I really wanted to just show you is this Transformative Educational Studies Project in South Africa, now, it has to be a discussant for this uh, project. I'll enlarge this so you can just see a little bit of it. Um, in uh, Vancouver in April. And it excited me because 
If you see at the end there, can you see here? This is the generic question every researcher is being asked to respond to in their own practice. How do I transform my educational practice as? And if you go down and you've clicked on that, you'll see some of the illustrative questions that if you have to form these now, and in a few minutes I'll just ask if you could form an I question and just share it with the person next to you, just to practice that sense of what does an I question feel like and what is it for you. How do I transform my educational practice as a teacher of science to first year learners from a disadvantaged educational background? I just hope you get that idea that each one of these is a, an I question. How do I do this? How can I improve? Not an egotistical I, but it's a really uh, a, a, an I which is really passionately concerned to make a difference and to live the values as fully as possible. But that's where you can access that transformative educational studies project uh, from the What's New section of the website, which will be here. So you just flip down the What's New section and you'll be able to get into this here. There is an Action Research Africa network which you can join here. So just by clicking on that, the form appears, you can just fill it in and send it back and you're in an e-forum where there are many researchers now from Africa contributing to that Action Research Forum as they are in terms of this practitioner researcher e-forum here and you can join or leave the uh, practitioner research seminar here. Um, and it's just um, an international gathering of people like ourselves who share their thoughts and their ideas. And the, these are just some of the recent um, emails. But actually, Bonnie Kaplan is in South Africa and she's been looking at um, economic issues to do with the black youngsters she's working with because she wants to enhance their economic opportunities, and she's explaining how she's actually doing it. I, I, Robin Pound, uh, <coughs> Robin Pound is a health visitor, and again, her doctorate was all about the values that she was holding as a health visitor in terms of the mothers and the young babies, and how she could actually help to enhance the quality of the relationship between mother and child and father and child. But you can access these in terms of the practitioner researcher group just by, as I said, clicking on that under what's new section. <coughs> now, could I just ask, was that, um, is that clear just in terms of where you can access these resources? Any, any points you want to ask me about before I just go to show you this uh, educational journal of living theories? So you know where you could submit your own stories to if you wanted to share them more widely. And these, again, a few people have got their doctors, Mary, you know, we're working on a, a, at a D, some have got their masters, others are non-accredited. And you'll see where you might be able to publish your story of what you're doing in your own country. Any other question before I, I show you that? Uh, because I'd like to just make sure that I'm answering whatever it is that you're feeling is important to you. Sure? Okay. Now, this is what I'd very much like to encourage you to bring your stories, so they're going this way through the portal. You know you can access an enormous amount now through this portal and use it freely. And this one, for example, I really like this that Yvonne Grotti from Dublin City University, I have to take it most of you, or all of you know Yvonne here, just sitting on the left. But no, but Yvonne, working at Dublin City University, um, as I say, she's just pioneered uh, a, a multimedia doctorate. Um, which has been put in under the new regulations. It's really hopeful, this. And uh, Maggie's been helping with some of the supervision there. But what Yvonne did was get out a whole special issue of this journal on digital creativity and video in the workplace. Now, all you need to do is to click on any of these, and as I say, you can access them, use them with colleagues, use them yourself, just to see if there's anything helpful within these accounts. But Yvonne is, again, with masters, and these are masters students, um, supervised these kind of questions. How can I produce a digital video artifact to facilitate greater understanding among youth workers of their own learning to learn competence? How can I use video to improve teacher engagement with my school's abundant ICT equipment? Now, each one of those 
is available from this um, journal of educational theory. And if you get into this one, these are the archives. For example, this one here, you've got Margaret's foreword, but you've got, look at Mary's. You've also got Mary's. How can I encourage multi-stakeholder narrative and reflection on the use of ICT in teacher professional development programs in Rwanda? Now, if you think of African leadership in ICT, um, and your stories, wherever you are, that you can bring your stories and share them to show what is going on as you work to improve your practice and influence it systemically the structures that you're working in. Again, Mary, I think, has also shown the way here in which some of these uh, accounts and stories can be made available from what is not an easy context in Rwanda. But again, I think that use of ICT and teacher professional development programs in Rwanda was one of the most exciting uh, papers to be produced in the EJOS, the Educational Journal of Living Theories. Now, those are uh, stories that you are capable of just sharing with others and which need not be part of an accredited program. <coughs> but if you are interested in accreditation, I'll just show you where you can access the doctorates and the master's programs and units, which people have already got accreditation for with these kind of eye questions. You know, how do I improve my practice? Uh, there's one in uh, Canada. Most of you are senior uh, administrators in the sense that you are responsible for many other people. Um, Jacqueline DeLong in Canada was the superintendent of schools, and she looked at how to create a culture of inquiry within one of the larger um, boards, the school boards in uh, Ontario and Canada. And I'll, I'll just show you where you can access these uh, pieces of research. But the two I would just point out to you, uh, which excited me again because of their originality in a new area. And one is by an Afro-Caribbean student called Eden Charles. And Eden um, advised <coughs> our late government on race relations issues. And he's friend, Ian Phillips, is also Afro-Caribbean, and Ian graduated this last year, and Ian had done a tremendous of work with disadvantaged black youngsters in London, and both of them brought into the university an understanding of Ubuntu. So until this time, the African understanding of an Ubuntu way of being had not been accepted as what we call a standard of judgment. It had not been used as an explanatory principle to explain someone's influence in what they were doing. So I just want to show you this because I think some of you may be interested in, if you're showing African leadership in ICT, what might that sense of Ubuntu, which has got its genesis in Africa, how might that be communicated as being very significant in literally relationships with others? Because in my experience of Africa, that idea of I am because we are is very, very significant. Whereas in my experience in England, in the States, in Canada, it, the egotistical I is much more to the fore. <coughs> Whereas certainly in the African context, it, it, in, a bit in China and Japan, the, uh, the collective um, is there. But in Africa, it, it feels to me to be rather special in terms of that notion of Ubuntu. And I, I gave the inaugural Nelson Mandela lecture at the University of Durban last July. And I was able to show a few minutes clips of um, Nelson Mandela actually talking about uh, the nature of Ubuntu and the meaning that that had had in his life. Uh, so I'll just show you where you can access this doctorate from Eden Charles, which explicitly brings Ubuntu um, as a living standard of judgment into the academy. And this is on the left-hand side of my web page. And it's in the Living Theory Theses. Now, these are all doctrines. You won't be able to read each one of these. I'll, when I get to Ian's, I'll just uh, <coughs> enlarge it. But you can see the, how do I evolve living educational theory praxis. Uh, that was the latest one. But if I can just go, I'll just go down and just see if I can find. Um, I might need Yvonne here. No, that's not It's just moving down the screen. Ah, there we are. There he is. Right, there. Now, I 
just wonder if you could read that title because that has been very, very significant in bringing the African notion of Ubuntu um, into the universities. And that last word is beyond decolonization. Uh, it's societal redefinition <coughs> and guilty of recognition. <coughs> I'm not quite sure what's happening. Just press back. This one? Yeah. Okay, now, <coughs> that idea of Ubuntu, which you will know much better than myself, because many of you here will be living literally that way of being. Now, the reason that it was rather special to get Eaton Charles and Ian Phillips's doctorates accredited in a Western university was that they brought that African notion of Ubuntu as a way of being and relating as a standard of judgment, which in terms of, we call it their ontology, their way of being, actually was at the heart of their explanations for why they were doing what they were doing. And Eden used not only multimedia, he'd worked in Sierra Leone, he'd had some really distressing experiences there just after the Civil War, but he was talking about how quite a number of the women that had had very serious problems and difficulties, very painful experiences, were part of his own humanization. And he shows through the narrative how they um, really educated him in terms of these values of humanity. He uses his art as well to communicate. Now, many people in this room will, I think, be able to use dance and you'll be able to use song, uh, drumming, in a way that in Western cultures, the Western culture would not be able to get close to the meanings that you can communicate through those cultural experiences and understandings that you have. <coughs> so it's not to shy away from using this kind of media now, and Yvonne uh, has used a lot of <coughs> singing and songs in her doctorate to communicate the meaning of emotion. Now I think this is where you could really break uh, boundaries in terms of African leadership in information and communication technology. You could show those abundant ways of being, but linked to your, if you like, energy, the life-affirming energy <coughs> that you have. There's a great humour and warmth in African communities that we need to see, I think, from this room here and then brought into the world through those e-portals. Uh, are you okay now? Because any other questions if you, you'd like to ask? Because I just want to make sure that you've got access to these resources, that you know where each one is, whether it's a, a doctorate, whether it's the access to the um, e-forums that you can link into, the Transformative Education Studies Project in South Africa, <laughs> that you can share some of your own ideas with. But again, just let me pause there and just see you know, how things are going for you and whether I'm making sense or whether there's anything that you're feeling you'd like me to develop. I just have another quick one. Yeah. And this for personal gain. I think it's like a dream come true that we can do the I thing now and share our practices and experiences. <coughs> uh, I just want to know whether the journal that you showed us, if it's peer-reviewed, within the category of a peer-reviewed journal? It is a peer-reviewed journal, okay, so, it, and it's a very rigorous open review process. So you'll see it's one of the only ones which is transparent. <coughs> and people have actually said how much they've actually uh, enjoyed going to look at how these um, papers are being um, reviewed. Uh, there have been critical comments backwards and forwards before it's reviewed. Now, because these journals, and Maggie has been exploring this, it takes a bit of time to get onto, for example, uh, the South African list uh, of journals that will be accepted in a university for the payments that South African researchers get for getting <coughs> refereed journal articles. Yeah? Now it's going to take a bit more time before a journal, it was 2008 when this began, to get it to that level. But the nice thing is, Teacher and Teacher Education as an international journal in October is accepting for the first time, and again that is in quite a few of the lists. In England, for example, we were using what's called our Research Excellence Framework, which in 2014 will be used to finance a lot of the research in UK universities. So that, again, is a really important question that, you know, about the peer review process and how uh, rigorous it is. Anything else? If you... I'm, going, I'm just... Yes, Johnny? Sorry. Two quick points. Is there a kind of um, agreed structure on how to structure an academic paper on action, uh, action research? When you're doing that thesis, you're submitting it. 
and there is there an agreed way that this is the structure to follow. And then number two, the methodology is used. Because all the same, there's some data you are gathering somewhere. Yeah. And because I have tried to look at this one and, I, and the methodologies, there isn't much. Uh, so is there, just give an insight, please. Yeah, and again, that, that is so important as a question. Now, I could bring Yvonne and, and Maggie in here because <clears throat> there is a way of starting off an action research inquiry which can have a particular form to it, which a lot of people find helpful. But if you stick to it after you've started, it can be constraining. Now, the form that a lot of people find helpful is this one. And I'll show you where you can access it. It's in, the, um, it's in this section of the web page. Um, and all you do is you say, right, it's an action plan. And if you go into that one, the action planning, um, some of the descriptions there about how you might go about it um, would be there. I can just bring that. Um, quite a few people use that cycle. Okay, you start off by saying, right, here is my question. As I say, I want to pause it and just ask each of you to form an I question. So you've got your I question, which is grounded in your values. You imagine what to do, you create your action plan, and as you're acting, you gather some data to make a judgment how effective you are. You then evaluate your effectiveness, and then you modify your ideas and actions in the light of those evaluations. Now that is a systematic form of action reflection cycle that action researchers often find helpful to get their inquiries underway. So that would be a form that quite a lot of the master's students have used in terms of you go into the master's program it's on the left and you'll see quite a number of them have structured their accounts with that form of action reflection cycle. The problem is if you keep using it, it's becoming constraining <coughs> because you should be actually constructing your own narratives. All of the doctrines are in the form of unique narratives. The form comes out of your practice. And the woman who's done a lot of this is giving the keynote at Beer, the British Education Research in September, in a week. She's called Jean Flandin. And she's been advocating the use of narrative for the last 25 years. So when you tell your story in your doctorate or your master's dissertation, you literally find your own, and the language is methodological inventiveness. So it's not a case of using anybody else's methodology. You don't apply anybody else's methodology. I've written a couple of papers, I'll show you how you can get one of them from Ejots. But the idea of methodological inventiveness is that each person in this room will find their own appropriate way to research their question in their context and give their own explanation of their learning. But you've got to have real faith in your own methodological inventiveness. You can draw insights from other people's methodology, like I was asked about phenomenology. You can also use <coughs> other things like case study, narrative inquiry. Uh, you can actually use grounded theory. But ultimately, it's you producing your story, and you think of everybody in this room will have their own unique history. Nobody will be able to tell the same story about why you're doing what you're doing now. And that's why each one of these PhDs has got a narrative, we call it the autobiography of learning, that the individuals actually show about their lives and what they've done with them and what they're learning. So I, you know, I hope that's a, an answer to that question, which is a very important one, about you know, the method and the methodology, and is there a, a, a template or a form? Because you'll see that each doctorate and master is unique. Each of your stories is unique. But nevertheless, they can reach very high standards of rigor and excellence. I, I don't know if Yvonne or Maggie, you want to say anything about your students, but Maggie and Yvonne have both been supervising these kinds of inquiries. And not one of the ones that I've looked at has literally been identical or even similar. Each person has told their own story in their unique way. Do you want to say anything Yvonne? Or... Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking of one recent um, student who, um, uh, he was a science teacher and he, he felt um, that he didn't want to be confined to actually 
uh, fitting into a particular methodology. So what he did is, in the very end, he came to understand that he was developing his own theory, and he was actually using his own inventiveness to come to that, but he was feeling, well, I don't want to be into a positivist, I don't want to be placed as an interpretivist, I don't want to be fitted, have to fit into a particular category. I feel that I myself want to look at my own practice, I want to explain exactly how I'm trying to improve my practice with my students, and in the end, I gave him Jack Whitehead's book, um, the, the paper that Jack will show you now, the 2008 paper, and Simon said, that's exactly what I'm doing. You know, he came to realise that what was coming through was his values, you know, and he was able to show his values in action over that period of time that he was working with his students. So that's one example of how some master students are coming to recognise that methodological inventiveness. Well, yeah. I, I suppose just personally, um, just having handed in the doctorate last week, I can say that the whole process of, of using the, the living theory methodology has liber liberated me, I feel, very liberated after being able to, to use my own story uh, to bring it into, into the academy and be able to, that it is actually validated, but it hasn't been quite validated yet, I have, to, I have to do the Viva in two weeks time, but just even so far that the process, ha even, if, even if I never got the Viva, I hope I do, but the process has been very, very liberating for me. Um, and, you know, I, I, would, I would think that, the, that for, for everybody that their story is worthwhile, um, and that's what I find with my students as well, they feel liberated in telling their own story because they can see that it actually has an impact on others because it, it is uh, of help and, and of use to somebody else to read the story. Are you okay with this? Because you see, Yvonne has drawn some insights from my own work. But it's not a case of applying my ideas. That's why I really enjoy the creativity and originality in these living theory theses because it is Yvonne's unique contribution, it is her living theory and she's drawn insights from the work of others but her methodological inventiveness, if you like, has stopped at just applying something. Now this is how you would just access a paper which would explain that and if you go into the What's New section, you click on the Educational Journal of Living Theories, you go into the archive and you go into the first issue and what I did here was I, um, <coughs> I actually wrote a whole paper on methodology, and it's there. It, it's there. Using a living theory methodology in improving practice and generating educational knowledge in living theories. Which again, it, it's just open for you to download that and use it whatever way you like. Now, what I'd like very much to happen is if you would just uh, spend, it, and it really is just two minutes each, and I'll just say switch. And I'd just like you to turn to your partner and just see if with one other person you can actually form that I, just an eye question. You know, if you think into your professional lives now, you think of something which is right at the heart of what it is that, if you're not, you are passionate about that you really care about and you're trying to do something about, you're trying to improve. So that question, well, how do I improve this? And if you could just, as I said, in two minutes, I'll just ask you to switch round so that you clarify both of you what an eye question might look like. And then I'll just ask if some of you wouldn't mind just sharing those eye questions. So could you start, please, just in twos, just say to your partner, just Try to see if you can help your partner formulate that I question, grounded in what it is that they're feeling passionate about and strong about.
research workshops is that that energy that you were just expressing together would be the motivating power that keeps the thing going. It would not be the person controlling from the front. Now, I'm just curious, would anybody mind just sharing something that you were talking about in terms of those I questions? Has anybody got an I question that they wouldn't mind just sharing as you were talking? <coughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, through the discussion that we have had here, we have found out that uh, we might fool ourselves by wanting to go into the world of what others have done. Well, as under normal circumstances, we are faced by challenges. If you are faced by challenge, the first thing that you do at the natural response is to look for alternatives within the environment if anybody has ever done something like that so that you pick on that option to assist yourself. If you don't find it that you are still in the same position and you must act, then you, you decide, you make a decision to take action. And when you fail and you must still get out of this problem and it's you still to make the decision, you must make the next planning cycle and and, and get, uh, get and once you succeed the unfortunate bit is most of us do not document that and what happens is that now you want someone else to have documented so my question is even the theories that we follow in the conventional research how did they evolve yeah. okay. <laughs> that key question is why action research is different from action learning you heard earlier today a really good action reflection cycle of action learning. Where the action research differs is that it is action learning. So action research includes action learning. But the action research actually makes public that story. That's what makes it research. It's your systematic inquiry which you make public. Now that could be your inquiry. And it's a really important one to bring those stories and through that portal into the world so it can influence on a much wider basis. Any others that you feel, yes, 
this is an eye question I feel quite passionate about. Anything? Because as you were talking, there was a buzz of energy between you. Which, as soon as I start, as I say, it goes, it dies. But I think some of you will have some of these passionately held questions that you really feel you would like to inquire into. And I'd just like to finish with some of those, if you wouldn't mind just saying what those, yes. Yeah, we have one question. Um, I would love this from Kenya. We had a question, how can I improve ICT uptake by teachers in teaching and learning of maths and science in secondary schools? We are teacher trainers. And uh, the uptake of ICT is very low. So we were pondering and thinking, how can we improve that? And we were thinking of, um, in the process, we should identify the factors that hinder the practice or the uptake. Then we narrow on one of the factors. If it is a past building, we narrow on that. And again, that's really well thought, that question. But then I know that, for example, Margaret is very interested in the science and maths area and improving uh, education in schools. And there will be other people in this room who I think also have a concern. And it's that connection and getting those conversations going. But you documenting that and then sharing it with others. So it's the accounts going through the portal to the wider society. That's a really great, <coughs> well-formed question. <coughs> Any others that you feel, yeah, this is what I can say, and then I'll stop because we've had our hour. But I'm really pleased, thank you for that. That's a really, as I say, well formed, really important question. And it would be nice over the next few months just to keep track of how you're getting on. Because I think you'd find that supported as well in others. Any others that you feel you would just like to share before we finish? Yes? Research is that action research is a more, more, part, more recent alternative to quantitative research. Then, of course, action research would be more liberal, that the individual is perhaps not constrained to the uh, traditional formats, you see. And therefore, then there's a challenge of how do you ensure standards? While moving towards action research paradigm, we try to copy a bit, perhaps copy and paste a bit, of the quantitative research paradigm that we've lived with for donkey years. And therefore, perhaps the challenge is, as we advocate for perhaps new look or new approach <coughs> to research, shouldn't we also critically think deep, deep, deep down whole process. Issues to do with standardization, issues to do with systems, for instance, review, the issue of review. Um, are we now saying we adopt VA review rather than the other review that has existed in the qualitative research? I know I'm not a very serious researcher. Before I come to your last question, yeah. it, it is that anybody hearing that response, which I'm really pleased you made, I would have thought would think that is not a question coming from an action researcher. It, that those are really important questions. And action researchers 30 years ago literally had to face up to those questions of standards and standardization. And quite a number of texts. And just after this, I'll just give you some of those references. Because we had to take those questions very seriously. Could I just come on to your last question? Let me it's, uh, it's actually a follow-up from Keith. Yeah. Uh, the in terms of action research, I've seen here that um, we are kind of uh, encouraging methodological invent inventiveness, where multimedia and more vision narratives are captured as part of the a research process in Africa, in African universities, will they, will they accept this approach of thinking outside the box, where visual and multimedia, multimedia 
approaches are used to present data or, or narratives themselves. Yeah, if you go to, uh, for example, Derby University Technology, I know that uh, John Connolly has just retired recently, but she has been promoting those forms of account. Now, if you go to uh, Stellenbosch University, which is, I think, a far more traditional university, so I'm not quite sure that their regulations use the multimedia. You go to Nelson Mandela University, and again, under Leslie Wood, before she's only just moved to uh, one of the northern universities, again, she was promoting these kinds of inquiries. And they've just got out a new journal, an actual research journal from Nelson Mandela University, which is accepting these kinds of accounts. But I, 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 you're right, I, I think like with Pretoria, or some of the other countries, like at Strathmore University, where we were in 2008, wasn't it? Nine, yeah. um, again, that we only changed our regulations in the UK at the University of Bath in 2004. Now, other universities, that's not a lot of time ago, only eight years. So I think you might have to um, encourage some of those changes for the submission of degrees. I was on the committee uh, at the University of Bath that recommended that change to allow the submission of e-media. And in 2004, it was one of my students that was the first student to put in an e-media. And now Yvonne has broken it even further with the kind of visual narratives that are put into DCU. <coughs> Are you okay with this? Because it is a political process and you'll need to sort out in your own universities what the regulations are, but use examples from other very high standing universities that have shifted their regulations. Are we okay now? Because as I say, my time's up. Okay, John, and, John, can I just yeah. mention that? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just want to mention one thing. I had a, a PhD student who just got through her PhD last week and she was using ethnography which is a qualitative method, um, methodology. And the examiners advised her to show, she was using a very traditional approach, ethnography. They asked her to show how she was actually moving the ethnography forward, that she was actually not using it anymore as a traditional method, that she was bringing it forward because of the digital media. So they required her as a final tweaking of her methodology to show how she was able to move it forward rather than keeping it as the same old traditional form. So people, examiners are not asking students to show how they're doing that. So, and, and that's in qualitative methods, and that's what she was using. Okay? Oh, yeah. Yes, and then we Jack, I think this is a fantastic opportunity. It is, it is definitely at least opens my thinking outside the box, because I just also recently completed my PhD within a very formal structure with the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And I couldn't share my practices and experiences because I needed to remain neutral at all times and remove myself. But now I see the opportunity. I teach, I train, I facilitate, I transfer skills in the area of e-learning, but where's the documentary evidence of that? And now I see an opportunity where I can use this journal for an example. And if, and if I have that opportunity, then I would like to reflect, reflect on how do I share my e-learning journey, practices, experiences in an ethical context with the world while embracing the richness of storytelling. Mm. And that's what I would like to do as an next step. See, but that is brilliant. You see, you can now, if you like, hold Maggie, and I, I don't mean this in an onerous way, but that is a sense of accountability. The Maggie has just actually helped us to understand the commitment that she has that you can now help by questioning Maggie about how that's coming. And everybody in the room can play a part in that and bring your own stories through that portal. But thank you very much for that, Maggie. But and many, many thanks again, Jerome, and other organisers for, you know, it has been a privilege to be with you. And the energy, believe me, that you've expressed is inspirational. So many thanks indeed for this evening. Listen, everybody, we've come to the end of a, of a very busy, hectic day, and I suppose finally, uh, I'd like once again to thank Jack for taking the time to come and to be with us here today, uh, I think in recognition of the, about the quality of the people we have here and the possibilities that you all will bring forward in your own ministries as we, you know, as you, as you become seriously influential and very, very knowledgeable, and you know, I, I think undoubtedly many of you will go on 
on to do your masters and PhDs. And I think the richness of the experience and the advice that we've got from Jack, I, on behalf of all of you, I'd like to thank him most sincerely. So if we give him another round of applause.